which won't be me. Greg, I just need a quick tutorial, so up, down, forward, back, yes. I didn't give Greg the title, I apologize for putting it up there. So there you go. Well, good morning and welcome. You may notice my accent is from the south, not Alabama. Um, I tend to speak quickly and we're going to cover a lot of ground quickly uh, in this session. Uh, we're already running the time. Um, as Stephen said, uh, even though I'm normally happy for you to interrupt, just if I do start speaking too quickly, put your hand up and tell me to slow down. Um, but if you've got questions, we'll be delighted to answer them as we go forward. Just some quick acknowledgements in terms of declarations, because those have been covered pretty well by Stephen. I thought I'd start by uh, talking uh, through this quotation, which I think is, uh, and I've said on standards committees around the world, you cannot get a clearer definition of cleaning than what Dr. Michael Berry wrote in his book, Cleaning for Health. The sole purpose of cleaning is to remove unwanted soils and rivers. And uh, it's interesting in this day and age, no matter how sophisticated it becomes, no matter which the journal, uh, that stands alone as the primary goal of this sector. And uh, it will, as we go through, you'll see that there's all sorts of great reasons why that isn't done very well. Now, I want to start by talking about my old friend, the Black Plague or the Black Death, Yersinia pestis. There's about 400 cases you probably are aware of in the US every year because it lives in uh, the field mice in down in the south in the desert. So the CDC gets up to 400 reports of cases of Yersinia pestis every year, even in the US this day. Of course, in the uh, 1300s, somewhere between 75 and 200 million people died. Now, in those days, we didn't really understand germs. We had miasma theory, and there's some stuff there about first century writers. Uh, the etymology of the word is basically pollution. The uh, root word also derives the term malaria, of course, it's associated with mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, and swamps. Here's one of the early books published on miasma, a helpful edition by a Polish author. I don't know that they've got so many swamps up in Poland when I was there, but uh, it's interesting, and they were really at the edge of the Black Death. But, of course, living closely in cold climate, uh, vermin bringing in the disease. There's some early PPE that you're probably familiar with. Uh, it turns up in all sorts of uh, comical terms, but that actually is what they wore when they had to go in and do it. And if you want the modern variety, it's remarkably similar. And, of course, we have another Ebola outbreak, for those who don't know, in DR Congo at the moment. It's moved across and hasn't got as far as Kinshasa, thankfully, but it's in Canada. Now, germ theory is just to refresh you because you would think this is well known, but you go into hospital and sometimes the worst exponents of what to do or of what to not do are the doctors. They seem to really think that their hands are clean and uh, whatever they do is above the level of microbiology. If you look at microbiology, though, the really significant break came when Van Leeuwen book invented the first real modern microscope that we could get 300 power and see the world that we couldn't see. Now, one of the cross-reference points I'm going to come back to is, ironically, in hospitals still around the world, they go looking for what they can't see. Visual inspection is still the primary industry of cleaning and hygiene measures. It's unbelievable. And even hand hygiene, their audit systems globally for hand hygiene depend on observational analysis, which is so marred by, by uh, the deconstructed uh, process of having someone stand in the corner with a white clipboard marking things off. Um, Hawthorne would have been proud beyond measure. And of course, the big breakthrough in terms of modern epidemiology was Dr. John Snow and the Bullet Street Pump, probably all know the story. Um, there was a, an outbreak of cholera that was found by John Snow to be particularly associated with a single pump, which later on turned out to have uh, been contaminated the groundwater, which contaminated the sewage. Now, it begs the question, why would you ever leave England? I'm just going to go over here because the uh, point is not working. And uh, 
Uh, this is an important uh, uh, thing just to note because um, some of the data is quite interesting. Here's the expected lifestyle for a, uh, a professional in Manchester. Okay, and this is this is in 1837 to 1841. The expected life term is 38 years, but if you're a labourer, it's 17 years. In Liverpool, it's 15 years. For Bentham Green Manufacturing, which of course is the dye used in arsenic, 16 years. Why would you ever leave England? You can understand why the Irish stole loads of bread just get sent to Australia as convicts uh, and get away from uh, the country. And yet that is indeed where the history of things were. And if you look at the epidemiology even from the US, this is a, a piece of data and I should accredit this properly. This is actually taken from... Uh, a wonderful uh, special edition of the American Journal of Infection Control from 2008, which was co-sponsored by the Stoma Detergent Association um, with wonderful epidemiological data. And I'm going to use a few slides here just to remind us of where we come from. But if you look at the epi data, you'll see that all of the significant spike outbreaks are all microorganisms, yellow fever, smallpox, cholera, cholera, smallpox. And so on we go. And it's always the children that suffer. The children always suffer. This is the this is the mortality, infant mortality. So this is under ten year old in uh, three different places: Massachusetts, England, and Wales, and the United States. We're going to use this point again because it's going to be a bit I'm sorry, but you'll see that up until about 1900, there's a really significant change in 1900, and before 1900. It's really grim. Uh, childhood mortality is terrible everywhere. There was no distinguishing issue. But from 1900 onwards, we suddenly have this diminishment. And a couple of significant things happened. Well, first of all, let's look back. I know you're, this is hard to see, but the top four causes of death, and again, these are from early data. The first one's 1916. The second one is from 1928, I think. It's from the and 1998. The important thing to note is in these two slides, all of the only causes of death are basically infectious or communicable diseases. And yet by the time you get to 1990, not only have the numbers dramatically dropped, but the causes are now totally different. And very rare is, in fact, infant mortality due to infectious diseases. And the crude death rate, of course, is going in the opposite direction to life expectancy as we improve things. And the big breakthrough which we're going to come back to a little bit, us very simple, separating sewage from water, getting vaccines working, and the introduction of modern antibiotics. But there's another impact factor that runs beautifully linear with um, the improvement of life expectancy, and it's this sector. This is a graph on the impact of hygiene products. Now, the other big thing that happened around 1900 that you probably will remember the older ones, like Stephen, um, is there was an outbreak at, uh, at the turn of that century of, uh, of Yersinia pestis globally. There was another mini outbreak. And it was moving around on the ships because global trade was starting to take place. The rats were moving around. And uh, one of the things that needed to be done was to fix housing, which was one of the other great steps forward. You need to make the houses vermin proof. We needed to make sure that we didn't have the rats living literally with us, the fleas with us. The mice needed to go. Cleanliness needed to improve. Running water came into houses. Sewage came into houses so frequently, or at least the night part, or the water was in the house, but the sewage was outside. And these breakthroughs are hygiene breaks. And the improvement of the hygiene marked in this graph, as I say, by the continuing sale of hygiene products, whilst it might be perfectly correlated because this is real life and not a uh, randomised type of trial, um, it looks very interesting. And, and our sector should be rightfully proud. I won't uh, basically show you that uh, too much, but again, you see the infant mortality rate also associated with the So obvious conclusions for the history. Vaccines, obviously, are important to improvements in housing, antibiotics, and the death rates have fallen proportionally. With improvements. So there's some history, a very quick run through. But let's look at more recent pandemics because that's what it gets really.
really important. Um, and I'm going to start with antimicrobial resistance because even though um, it's very current now, it actually started, when you look at the data, from even before antibiotics were introduced in 1946. So first commercial use of antibiotics in 42 during the Second World War. But in fact, in 1940, even though the penicillin breakthrough was 28, in 1940, Howard Florey already proved that Staphylococcus aureus could develop inherent resistance through sublethal exposure. So even before the antibiotics hit the market, we knew there was going to be a problem. And when you think about it logically, we're using fungus to fight bacteria. Now, depending on your view on, on evolution, that's a fight that's been going on for between 400 million years, 20,000, 10 years. But they've been fighting together pretty successfully for a long, long time. And I mean, what were we thinking? What, this is the panacea forever, that they aren't going to work it out? Of course they're going to work it out. That's what bacteria do. And of course, now you've got things like ESPLs moving around, mortality rates are horrific. Um, the, the big part that we're all really worried about is a thing called Christiella pneumoniae. There's only been one mini outbreak in the US at this stage. If that bug gets loose, it's one of the ones that really has tremendous characteristic capacity to resist antibiotic and resist basically. Now, of course, the next pandemic we come to is uh, really quite a large one as well, and that is the summary of HIV. Uh, first really observed in the 1980s, but in fact, genetically, and this is the advantage of modern genetics, we now know through uh, retrospective study that this virus probably came out of chimpanzees into humans somewhere in the area around Kinshasa, which is now what we know as the uh, Congo. We got here at one stage, the Congo before that, probably in the 1920s. And there were probably low-level cases that bubbled along for quite a long while, but somewhere, for some reason unknown, in the 80s, it broke loose. And by the time it was realistically identified by first by the French uh, in Pasteur and then confirmed by the CDC, there were somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 people that had already been infected by HIV. And I won't go through the full time series, but I will make a quick mention of a very significant thing, which is that in 1985, the CDC released the first edition of Universal Precaution. Now, it was all over HIV, and let me summarise it for you. Key point, use lots of barrier protection. Take care with blood and body fluids. Lots of barrier protection. Clean everything thoroughly with a neutral detergent. Totally undefined. We'll come back to that. And then use heaps of chlorine, anything more than a thousand parts per million. But the early edition actually had it at 10,000 parts per million. So that's 10,000 times the amount of chlorine you have in your swimming pool. And that was going to be used globally. Really significant, aiming at HIV, which we now know is actually quite hard to catch. Uh, you've really got to work at catching HIV compared to, say, the hepatitis. You know, one in three needle sticks with hepatitis B virus will go zero positive. That same number of HIV is about one in 300. So it's relatively difficult to catch compared to some of the other bloodborne viruses. But that document had global ramifications. Not because it actually stopped HIV, because really, men who have sex with men catch HIV. Certain women will catch HIV. Intravenous drug users will catch HIV. People who receive blood transfusions from uncontrolled blood sources may catch HIV. So there's a bunch of people who are high risk. But the general population, healthcare workers, incredibly low risk. And of course, um, I don't have time to show you, but there's a, if you want to see a really terrible early ad, this is an Australian ad. I really wanted to show it to you, but it goes for too long. You can look up that uh, YouTube website and watch The Grim Reaper playing bowling ball with human skittles at the end of the uh, end of the row. It's horrific about take care with HIV. And the reality is that since the 80s, mortality is about 40 million. <laughs> Nowadays in the modern world, with the medicines we have, it's much more a chronic illness than a, a mortal disease, but there you are. Now, we got into research as a company early on in the 80s. There's some of our research team. Uh, from the late Professor Yvonne Kossart, my father is up there, 
and also uh, Professor Karen Vickery, who continues as a, as a research uh, associate with us. And we got into, into looking at cleaning, particularly in endoscopes, because obviously uh, they're a problem. And when you talk about endoscopes, you're talking about things that are very intimately associated. I'm sure that all of us have seen so many faces and the hairs that are perhaps graying a little bit. Hopefully you've all had your local colonoscopist do uh, a procedure for you to check that you've got no polyps. You should, of course, all be being done once you turn 50, at least every five years, and once you turn 60 every second year, so they say. And, and it's a very touching experience. <laughs> now, it will come as no surprise to any of us that uh, most human pathogens come from other humans, and we help the bugs out. There is our little friend walking down the corridor with his UV pole, unguided, unassisted. And, of course, when he lays on the bed, he's ready to go, and so too are the bugs. Now, I just want to briefly mention this because they are interesting. Um, uh, they are a reusable medical device. They're subject to cleaning and sterilisation, and they're subject to the sporting classification. And there's been a whole bunch of literature about uh, endoscopes. Uh, one of the prominent co-authors in the field is saying we should definitely move to sterilisation of these things rather than other disinfection. The flaw is he doesn't understand that particular author has really not understood some of the information I'm going to speak to you of today. So one of the problems, of course, is we've got bad design. This is an endoscope. This is an ERCP scope that was associated with the liposcope and subject to recall. And that little button at the end there folds out into the pancreatic duct. So it goes all the way in your tummy, down through here, through the two sphincters, and pops itself all the way up into your pancreatic duct. And the little thing goes, whoop, pops out, and a little wire comes out and has a look around. The trouble is, it's almost impossible to clean the pan. And it's been associated with outbreaks. So there was an outbreak of uh, a pan E. coli um, that uh, an MC period uh, and uh, uh, 12 people at least, uh, probably more like 25. There's been a bunch of this. This is, public. this is a paper that reviewed the issues in the infection control hospital epidemiology. Our products were actually involved in this because they were being used at the particular review here is from UCLA and were being used at that particular location. But the story starts <clears throat> much earlier. We got into this in the 90s. And we found that endoscopes generally weren't being very well cleaned. And so we had a bunch of students that we were sponsoring back in the 80s, one of whom has now gone on to become, uh, in fact, the lead author here, Arnold uh, Diva, is a, a very noted plastic surgeon, still working in biofilms. And in fact, his latest work has shown that breast implants that have a textured surface are materially associated with an oncogenic switch leading to a white blood cell cancer in certain subgroups. And so there's actually a mini outbreak of a cancer caused by a biofilm on the breast implant of this certain type of breast implant. And they're being recalled sporadically at the moment, but the FBI hasn't really recalled it, but it's actually well, TJ has recalled the whole lot. The French have already worked with recall. So that's Arnon's work. But he found early on that we, we could find all sorts of viral nucleic acids, even after we'd been through a cleaning process. And in fact, one of the uh, early findings, we had this very funny incident where we, we found that there were certain scopes failing and we went down and had called into a special meeting and, my God, you know, we've got all this failure and what's going on? And we were using glitter aldehyde in those days, pretty good sterilant. And it turns out the scopes weren't being cleaned properly. They were missing it. And so then they have a mini recall and that was literature. And that led on to a whole pile of stuff uh, about soils. Michelle Alpha, who's a very notable academic, a Canadian academic, actually has a review piece in the latest issue of American Dental Institute on biofilms and their effect on reusable medical devices and the issue of cross section. But the focus was really about soils and even the disinfecting testing methods used in this country and in Australia and elsewhere focus on adding dirt into the disinfectant test now. But dirt or soil is not biofilm. We used to think they were the same. We used to think that the bacteria were, if you like, trans they pass on by. But I'm going to show you with a few uh, slides. We now know that's not the case. Now, one of the key people here is the late and great, very great, Professor Bill Costin, his daughter still lives in Australia. I met 
fortunate place for a number of times at the University of Princeton and uh, building more on biocompany. I wrote seminal papers on it, Scientific American, uh, lots of textbooks, was a terrific And uh, some of our work derived originally from Bill, including after a discussion where we went looking for biofilm on the industry. Is that why they're failing? And what we found was when we recovered interstates from the field, nearly all of them were contaminated with bacterial biofilm. We're not talking dirt. We're talking constructed communities of bacteria, often heterogeneous, and I'll show you some slides on that. And in those communities, the bacteria yabber away like a bus full of eight-year-olds returning from their favourite excursion. I mean, they talk and yabber and talk, and they talk in a way that they understand. And it's taken us until modern times and modern generations to understand this a lot better. When we talk, we form a word in our brain. It's communicated through nerves to our vocal cords. We enunciate the word. The hearer hears the sound because it's basically a physical force moving across. But when bacteria talk, they talk in encoded pieces of protein little bits and pieces of protein, and they tell each other all sorts of things. Now, when we went looking for biofilm, this is biofilm we found on real channels. There's some different powers here. So this little slide here, A, that's basically at, at 50 microns, you set bar down there. And then when you go in close, so that's five microns, oh, there's cockroids, rods, and they're just having a lovely time. This is actually terrific uh, in a horrific, because that biofilm is about to flake off and end up in the death gut of the next patient. So you talk about fecal oral transfer or, um, you know, we're doing um, um, fecal transfers for CDI or at the moment the uh, FDA has shut that down because, surprise, surprise, they managed to transfer some MR those patients. Right? But again, inside that biofilm, you've got this rich heterogeneous community of bugs living happily together and they can survive all sorts of things. We wanted to know how, how well you clean them off. One of the things we found straight away, enzyme cleaners were the, at that stage the number one still are, the number one way of cleaning in the state. What we found was the enzymes worked well for the top half of the biofilm, but they never touched the bottom end of the biofilm. And, and when you subjected the scopes to, say, 20 reprocessing, where you recontaminated, cleaned it, recontaminated, surprise, surprise, the bugs learned resistance. And what we found was basically uh, you need to have something that specifically removes the biofilm in the right way, or you will not clean the endoscope. That's a great slide. So you can't see that. 10 microns, so that's uh, 1 100th the pointy end of a pin. You'd never see that. And yet when you go in at high power, again, bits of organic debris and bugs. Everything. And of course, if you've Familiar with the endoscopes, they're shoving stuff up and down the channels. All you need is to crease one of the channels, create a small cut, and the bacteria take that. We've done more recent work. This is actually from a more recent paper, 2018, on, on what sort of profile of bugs live in scopes. And that's basically showing you the concentration. So, so figure one is basically the profile, less than 10 bugs, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000. And you can see it's a lovely distribution. And this is anaerobes and aerobes. And you can see there's a good distribution. When you look at the different species, you can see the level of speciation. And the interesting thing we know is the bugs talk to each other across species. So they share information across species. That's incredibly important in a cleaning context. And though the endoscope suites vary, um, and there's just a couple from the web, you see there's all sorts of things. I don't know how to clean now there's one, and those have got all these trolleys and carts and bits. Of course, the main action's on the bed. Like I said, they go to the patient, I send a scope, and away we go. Here's a rather frightening quotation from a recent paper. Rectal colonisation with BSDL and bacteriale is associated with an increased risk of hospital-acquired pneumonia, bacteremia, and UTIs with the same organism. In other words, once it gets associated with down there, it moves around. And that is a really important point. Now, the hot zones around the bed, we knew that for a while. This was 
uh, a little cartoon I've drawn from two papers, one by Bill Hota, who's up at Rush Medical Centre, another one by an English author. But what you find is the beds were hot, so you can always find the bugs on the bed, but the patient is. And the closer you are to the bed and things that get touched, the more important. Well, funnily enough, I drew this cartoon when I started my doctorate. And I now know it's wrong. And I'm going to show you why it's wrong. And it's wrong for hilarious reasons at one level. I used to think, oh, well, it's just the infidels, you know. No. Let's go into an ICU. The dead zone. We know that the bugs move around equally between patients and surfaces of healthcare workers. Now, let me talk quickly to hands. This is actually out of an American Journal of Infection Control paper from last year from a good friend of ours, Professor Mary Lou the Claus. And in this paper, they did a, a couple of wards study and they did some interventions. I won't explain it, except to say that the top line there is the official hand hygiene compliance rate, which runs at around 80%. When they triangulated the data, the bottom line is the actual compliance rate, which ran between 30 and 50 So you've got about a one in one in three to a one in two chance that the clinician who touches hasn't actually washed their hands. Now, that might seem significant until you look at, this was a clinician about to touch a patient during the study, and, uh, and they challenged and said, oh, he said, my hand's clean. They said, all right, we'll let you go without doing hand hygiene, but let's take place. This is blood agar paper. This is his non-dominant hand that's growing scap aureus, and on his dominant hand, he's growing VRE and scap Okay? So, surgeon ready to go. And uh, just to make it clear, what we did was, I'm going to talk about our biofilm methods because they're important. I'm going to come back to the universal proportions of them. But I just want to point out that hands are really good. And what this, this paper shows, we took hands, we put them on a biofilm with staph aureus, and we saw how many touches we could transfer the staph aureus. And we're still getting bugs at 19 touches. We thought, well, what happens with gloves? So this is a paper from 2019, Infection Control Hospital Epidemiology. And basically, we found the same thing that even if you put gloves on, most clinicians wear gloves to protect themselves, not the patients. That's why they keep touching. Um, what's really interesting about this is if you look at the Y axis there, that's 120 bugs. Different types of gloves have different levels of stickiness for the bugs, but you can see they're still showing up 19. Watch what happens when you add a little bit of wetting to the surface, you add a neutral detergent. That is now tenfold. So you get 10 times the number of bugs pick up on wet gloves. And they still transfer nearly as much up to 17. And this is why that graph was wrong. It turns out, and this is from Bill Hogan's paper from 2009 in the Journal of Hospital Infection. You can see, I, I, I did them in red because you can't see them in white, but everywhere that gets touched is where the bugs end up. Yeah, they start on the bed, but they move. And they move with hands. This is uh, some work that we're actually still writing up from night at all. It's a slightly different presentation. But what we found, this is from a paperless paper in 2016. In a similar study, we did this mini walkthrough. We started with a clean bed on one side of the ICU, walked down the, 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 the healthcare worker corridor to a clean bed on the other side of the ICU, and we swabbed everything as we went along. And what we found was the beds were actually being cleaned by the cleaning staff in ICU really well. Guess what? It was everywhere else. Because no one perceives they got dirty hands. The beds are the two clean bits at the end. This is things like the door handle to the nurse's station, the door handle to the sterile medicine's lock room, the uh, buttons on the pathology sampling device. And here's some of my favourites. The nurse's station, or the, that's unfair to nurses because everyone in ICU goes there, was filthy. No one hardly cleans it. It gets it once a week. Here's my favourite dirty item. You've probably heard me talk about this before. When you walk up to the ICU uh, uh, section there, first thing you do is sit down. And what do you do? You pull the chair across. And then you adjust the height. So where do you think we found the biofilm and the MROs? Up here on the chair. But these are the two favourites. This is the sterile medicines distribution trolley. That comes with free VRE. And here's the crash cart that comes with VRE and MRI stage. Quick, patient three. Save them. 72 hours later, they died horrific. Now, this is a very similar paper from 2012. 
We have an outbreak, or not an outbreak, that's not fair. The endemic rate of infection in particular ICU was running at more than 20% of index. They tried everything, chlorinated everything, did everything. Finally, they had a new ICU they installed, and our team got to go in and literally cut it apart after it had been twice cleaned and disinfected the terminal. So they did two terminal cleans, and then our team went in onto dry surfaces, chopped it up. And basically, we found biofilm everywhere. We don't have a lot of time to go through it. Uh, this is in the paper, but the biofilm varies from spider lab type material. That lovely piece there is a piece of rayon on the flesh line, but it's on the mattresses and the bed base. The, the entry doors, the part of plexiglass doors that you walk through, we cut the bit out where everyone's hands, that came with VRE on entry as well, and an MRSA on entry. Fantastic. So you walk in one side, you get VRE, and you walk out the other side, and you get MRSA. Quite extraordinary. Mattresses are particularly interesting. So again, there's low power, and you zoom in, and you zoom in some more, and you find biological material on that. So we know that obviously if the patient's lying in the bed with no pants on, it's pretty easy for gravity to take effect in the bugs. We think to move down through. A paper we're working on at the moment has been right up. We've actually now proven that the bugs not only go down, but you can actually get them to come back up through the sheet. They put sheets and lid on it. And these mattresses were disinfected terminally after every patient with chlorine. So... Now, that work's been extended. What we've done is we've done a five continent so far. The US actually is pretty slow to catch on to some of this, although I am aware that there are three or four really significant studies underway into this at the moment. One at Rush, another one, I think, the Curtis Johnson group at PA in Cleveland. But we've shown basically through recovering of samples from five continents that there's about 90% of the high touch objects that we've looked at have got biofilm, including active MROs, despite terminal disinfection. Now, where it gets really interesting, this is a paper from uh, Infection Control Hospital Epidemiologist by a colleague of mine, Slade Jensen, and some others, Anthony Lee is the first off author. And what they did was, on this, in this particular hospital ICU, they were swapping the patients as they came in rectally and uh, orally, looking for MRSA and BRE and any MRO that they had. So they've got really good identification of who's got what as they come in. And then they regularly swap the patients. So once a week, everybody gets swapped. And on, on the day they leave, they get swabbed again and they go looking for it. And in this particular uh, uh, study, over a quite long period, um, the index patients are here. The green issues are all of the environmental objects that were found with this particular Van A, Van B, VRE. And it's things like the infusions, palms, and the IV poles, point of care, ultrasound devices. But then they managed to track the patient and then the transmission over time. And they're using modern genetics, so I won't bore you with the modern genetics, but all of the transmissions were less than three step differences, which means the bugs are identical. Now, what's really interesting in this, that is all failure to clean. These bugs have not moved patient to patient. They may have moved clinician hand to clinician hand on the case. They have moved into the environment, been left in the environment, been touched in the environment and gone back to a patient in the environment. Now, the lawyers haven't worked all this stuff out yet. And uh, I've said to a number of people, when the lawyers work out that this is actually negligent, it's going to be like a bunch of hot frogs on rock because all hell will break loose. And the way that it's working is modern uh, IV workers using devices like this Maldatol, Vitex 2, all this data is being collected and it's there for a good old fashioned summons to examine. And I won't bother to go through that, but again, more of it. So let me move on. Critical quotation the survival of microorganisms on Earth, the critical issue is their ability to evade by a gap. Now, this is work. There are two types of ways they adapt. They adapt, first of all, by inherent. Mutations or inherent variability so that they, they can actually uh, adapt by their own mechanisms. This is work from the 50s published in 64 by Isabel Mora, where she took a standard Pseudomonas originosa, 
This is in her book, Hospital Hygiene. She starts out with a blend of cetramide and uh, flexible glutinate. She works out what the lethal concentration is. She backs it off just a little so she's got a few survivors. But over 16 weeks, she could subsequently re-inoculate those survivors. And finally, she cuts off the experiment 16 weeks and uh, 64 times the level of activity that's inherent. But what we know is the bugs are actually doing more than that. The big impact of universal precaution was that the neutral detergent washing system has never been validated. They don't define what a neutral detergent is. Uh, it's neutral. Ionic, ionic, anionic. Or is a pH neutral talking, say, 4 to 6, 6 to 8, or 8 to 10? What, what is it? And, of course, if you put that in a pretty standard table, you, you end up with nine variables. Which variable will we go for? Which one's validated as best? It drives me insane. You talk to the nurses, the ICNs, and they go, oh, we just use more. Or it's not a go, all right. She died a long time ago, and after working in the Crimean War, perhaps we could move on with our science a little bit. Probably be a good plan. Yeah. So, the disinfectant, of course, was chlorine. So here's our theory. Our hypothesis was in our latest round of work with the grant we just finished was that what the bugs are doing is they're going, fantastic, look at this, how stupid are these people? They give us a wash and a clean and a feed, all the dirt just gets moved around because the cleaners use a circular motion or they take the cloths and they use them here and use them there and touch this and touch that and it's all filled up with this soapy solution. Oh, wonderful, we have a drink and then it starts dry. And they come along with chlorine and they go, quick, hide. Everyone hides the device. <laughs> Well, we had to invent new methods to get to our cleaning nirvana, and uh, I'll just quickly run through. Our first publication in this series was by Alman Armstrong, a wonderful young uh, researcher who's now back in Saudi Arabia. Uh, our theory was, you know, the bugs are on the surface, uh, you, you wash them and feed them, and then you dry them, and you come back and feed them up. When I did micro, and for those of us that have done micro, uh, even earlier than I did it, it was all about, you know, testing and stuff. It was like sending them on holiday to the Bahamas or Fiji. Warm, there's lots of breeding going on, there's lots to eat, everyone's having a happy time. Turns out if you really want to see what they do, you beat them up a little bit. Make them work for their living. Put them under stress. This method takes 14 days, but you end up with a biofilm that basically is morphologically and characteristically identical to what this is. And so that allowed us to do a bunch of experiments. So here's a couple. We managed to prove that they resist chlorine, actually up to 20,000 parts per million. So that's pretty good. We've got the sister spider cells at 20,000 ppms. But we also managed to show that they also will um, resist heat treatment up to 121 degrees, three minutes, 15 psi, which is the old flash sterilizer. Now, we cut the experiment off. Karen cut the experiment off because she just ran out of time. But she thinks we would have had persistent cells after standard order class once you've got them in form. And we have been able to show you can remove the biofilm, and there's, there's a bunch of oxidizing materials that we've, uh, we've done. But here's the thing biofilms are not just dirt and slime, they are self sustaining communities. You can't detect them easily because standard swabbing doesn't work. So when we're doing our environmental swabbing, we've moved from cotton swabs to a sterile gauze with the braided across surface in one paper by uh, a, a local clinician who had an outbreak of um, multi-resistant anastomosis pneumoni, which had a 54% mortality rate. He went to that method. We followed him in that method. He showed that he could re recover 200 times more time. Because Aston is a great biofilm. And then we've got the latest one, which you may have heard of, Candida Horus. This is a lovely paper by Bill Adala looking at disinfectants. We won't go through. It's actually on the if you need it. Um, it's a yeast, a wonderful biofilm form. When I was at uh, the, the Society of Hospital Epidemiology of America meeting last year in San Diego, the uh, state pathologist in New York got up and basically said they'd moved from site containment to ring containment on all the boroughs. Of New York. High mortality rate, mainly older men because they're cedarized. Once you have candidemia, that's the bloodstream, it's around a 30 to 50. And that one is moving 
like like uh, 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 some of the other bugs, from right to left across, starting on New York. This bug was only first reported in humans in 1994. Uh, it's quite a recent thing. Now, I'm going to finish just by quickly talking about wiping. Because you would think the number one thing, the number one thing that's done in cleaning is wiping. Here's our cleaners, they're about to go out there and do their little job. Woo! That's my five minute warning for John. Thank you. <laughs> now, here's a lady, I hope she's cleaned the bed. There's a patient in that bed you may or may not see. This is a photo from the web. I don't know why she's cleaning that part of the bed railing down there as though that's a high touch section. I don't know how she's done all the stuff at the back, all the different knobs. Dial, touch button. I had a conversation with one uh, senior person in the UK where she said, All you need is to control one variable, and, and you, then you do your cluster trial. And I'm like, There's a beautiful paper from Sayed Sakar and East, John East Milan, where they defined nine separate variables in the simple act of wiping. So if you're going to do a cleaning study epidemiologically, how do you control for nine variables in wiping the line? Now, this is a piece from uh, Bill Rattal, and I've turned into a, a little bar chart. But basically, what's really interesting about this from Bill and the team over at uh, UNC was they showed that you could kill a C. diff, but what was really interesting, they were using white, and a neutral detergent white and a quad white worked just as well. There's no statistical difference between these. So, you know, you've got a lot of bleach, a lot of hydrogen peroxide, a lot of chlorine here, and then you've got massive amount of hydrochloric. Uh, that's 100 kill. Um, no statistical difference. Just by properly wiping it twice, aseptic wipe, really interesting stuff. I won't bother to read that. Here's another really interesting study from uh, Curtis Donsky's group, where they look at what was on the floors of CDI patient rooms. What's really interesting was they found the CDI was basically across all of the patient rooms. But when it comes to, so here's the CDI patient rooms and here's the non-CDI patient rooms, there's no statistical difference between those two bars. But you can see that they're across the hospital as full. But in the CDI patient rooms where they're on serious antimicrobial therapy, the selective pressure means you get three times as much up in the state and twice as much free up there. What was really interesting to match this in this particular study was they also looked at what had fallen onto the floor and was picked up and put back to the patient. About 20% of the room had something that had gone to the floor, come back to the patient's bed level without it. And when it comes to microfiber and cleaning, this is not even a recent paper, 2008, that's microfiber VRE. Great way to spread VRE, you just keep on touching it. Staph aureus, no different again. Uh, Viruses, transfer of cleaning cloth, these are all nothing new. Um, yeah, this is very recent from uh, John Lee's Millard. This is actually with Candida Auris. What you can't see, but it's a really interesting paper, is that's using plain water. And statistically, all these are basically statistically the same. So, water alone with a white does as well as most of the church removing Candida Auris. That's because it's in a bio. Now, there are only two met test methods for uh, wiping. One's a very dinky little method that's been published locally. It's an ASTM method that uses a wiperator. It's got a one centimeter circular square and goes whoop, 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 three times and it goes whoop, 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 three times the other way. How that represents the cleaner, I've got no idea. The other one is similar to what we're doing. And we have literally, just this last couple of days, got this paper onto the web where we took standard bacteria, staph aureus culture, dried them onto our, our surface. And then use wipes. And what we found was after basically two or three wipes, we removed nearly 100% of the bugs. Four. And uh, we took it up to you know, 20 wipes. You can't do that. But when you put a dry surface biofilm into the same process, we only removed 1.4 wipes after 50 wipes. You can't wipe the biofilms away. So this has literally got a DOI of this month. It's on the web for those that's got access now in the journal hospital. One of the principles of wiping that uh, is enunciated by Eve Millard and Fair Sakari, you should use one wipe on one surface in one direction. Now, I want to go back to an ATP paper 
by Jean and Richard, two minutes, where they had a wiping system they used to make sure the desks were clean. I've subsequently validated that in a different way. Um, Richard's got a, a, a paper in the current issue of American Journal of Infection Control, current issue but one, where again they wipe to get the surface clean. And the way you're wiping is very different. Now, we don't have time to do monitoring. There's some stuff that we've covered as part of the journal. The second issue of the journal, you get most of this. Let me summarize quickly to conclude the emerging threat. AMR, even yesterday on CNN, they had an outbreak in Pittsburgh in the uh, Children's Medical Center of 10 cases of a new version of MR, say locally, where kids are sick and dying. And uh, some of the uh, kids who have been discharged, been colonized, but haven't got the target just yet. Biofilms and cleaning methods, this is a huge area. It's going to open up in front of us all. Genetic tracing is going to have a massive impact on cleaning. When the lawyers work out that they can prove that there's been cleaning failure and infection as a result of cleaning failure, it's going to be picnic days. Um, it's going to be very, very scary. And, of course, the bugs are all still out there talking to each other. As we invent new antibiotics, it usually takes less than six to 12 months to attain resistance and start talking to each other about how to do it. And what, what's the next new part? So the conclusion, cleaning remains the first key method for including, improving environmental hygiene, despite the fact that pest methods are poor, and uh, we really don't have standardised criteria on product performance. Name one cleaning uh, detergent product anywhere in the world that uh, met an objective standard through an independently verified test and been out and verified by a regulator doesn't exist. Cleaning monitoring methods, there's a huge amount of work there. Others will speak. The biofilm area is, is subject to current research. I'm off to the uh, Euro Biofilms meeting next month in Glasgow. Uh, CDC have now got a specialist working group on biofilms. Collaboration is the next thing I want to speak to. One of the amazing things about uh, our business is we've collaborated with uh, the tertiary sector research sector for more than 30 years. It's been the way of growth for our business. The research is two ways. We don't let the fear of the marketing thing interfere with the science. We let the findings be the findings and then find new ways to do things better rather than crushing the findings because they don't suit our marketing method. That is just the... You know, let's go back to watching Chernobyl again. You want to see how things are done, let's go to PKD and reactor and pop it in close to somewhere because that's how you got Chernobyl. No, you have to let the science teach you and then learn from it. That's the way of it. More power to Siri, I thank Tim Harris and Professor Spivak, and I thank you all for your kindness. There's some acknowledgement, and uh, I hand back to them. Greg, with complete appreciation, a brilliant presentation. Again, yeah. Uh, John Downey, uh, timing, uh, Greg is the moderator.